On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Jenna Lee. And unfortunately for Jenna Lee, she was conned into a trusting relationship with a firefighter that methodically broke her down for his own sadistic pleasure and need to control. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of narcissistic abuse. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad, and thanks for tuning into this episode. So what is a narcissist, you may ask? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, we refer to a narcissist as anyone who has displayed a pattern of behavior that shows a limited capacity to appreciate others' perspectives. It's that simple. And now before we get to our episode with Jenna Lee, I just want to thank everyone in the Narcissist Apocalypse community for listening to the show and sharing your thoughts by email, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. A big shout out to everyone on our Facebook group who's been participating and helping. It's been fantastic. It's been a wonderful experience. And a reminder, if you haven't left us a review on whatever podcast service you use, Spotify, Apple, Google, Stitcher, CastBox, etc., Leave us a five-star written review if you can. It helps out the show when it comes to rankings. If you can't write a review, just click the five-star button. Now, once again, I have to put a bit of a moratorium on doing recordings because our vetting call and recording call schedule is already pretty booked up to the mid to end of December already. However, if the quickest way to be part of our show is if you want to read a letter to your narcissist and be part of our letters to narcissist compilation episode, we've already done number two. We're going to do number three. We have a voicemail recorder on our website to record. Go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. It's on the right side of the page. It's always floating around. It's hard to miss. There's the button that says send voicemail. Press it and away you'll go. We're accumulating these for volume three of that type of episode. So send those voicemails in. If you want myself or my old pal Melissa to read your letter instead, Just send it to NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com. Everything is almost out of the way here, but I have one last thing. I've been building a directory, which will be a paid directory for narcissistic abuse therapists and coaches. It's close to being ready for all you professionals out there to populate it. So get a hold of me if you want to be part of that directory. And you can get a hold of me at directory at NarcissistApocalypse.com if you're interested in being one of the first professionals on there. And unlike other directories, ours will be attached to a community forum that works a lot like Cora. So when it's up and running, anyone will be able to ask questions on narcissistic abuse, but only those professionals on our directory will be able to answer. I think this is going to be a very valuable resource for everyone involved, and I'm really excited to debut it for everyone in the coming weeks. Hopefully, we get it all up and running uh, smoothly by the end of December. So I'm really looking forward to that. And now... I'm going to get out of my own way. Here is my interview with Jenna Lee, and I'll check back in with you when it is all over. Welcome to this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, and with me today, I have Jenna Lee. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well, and just so everyone knows out there, uh, you were in a relationship with a firefighter, and this is one of those stories of you know trusting someone of authority. We've had one of these stories before with uh, Layla when Layla trusted the police officer. So if anyone out there is listening and is has been in one of these situations and has never really spoken up, this is a really interesting episode for you to listen to because Jenna is a very good storyteller, and she's going to tell this story with... Uh, within the three act structure that we have uh, started to do. And now uh, I am just going to, I guess, get out of your, uh, your way and start with the prologue of, of this before act one, just kind of give us a background of you. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I would say I was raised in a pretty typical household. You know, I had a mother 
who stayed home and a dad who worked full time. Um, you know, very loving family. They are good parents. But both parents brought in a lot of trauma and a lot of baggage from their past. My mother suffers from severe depression and anxiety. So that's uh, something that I kind of had to watch throughout my childhood and even into my adulthood is, you know, coaching your mom, trying to make, uh, trying to make things better for her, um, kind of being the, the parent in some situations. And then a father who, you know, my dad was a pretty level-headed guy, but he went through some really severe trauma in his childhood a lot of brothers and sisters who suffered through mental illness. And then um, right before my parents got married, my dad's parents were killed by a drunk driver. So he's had, you know, unresolved trauma, things that he hadn't dealt with. And obviously that trickles down into, you know, your future will trickle, you know, it, it moves forward into your future and, you know, you're the relationships and your relationships with your children. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I had great parents. I never doubted that my parents loved me and I you know, would never have those questions, but they did bring a lot of drama. Um, there was, you know, with the mental health issues, there's a lot of chaos. So, I mean, I would say that I was pretty much the rock in the family. You know, like you had mentioned when we had spoke earlier, a loyalist, you know, sounding board to my mom, you know, kind of just that person that my parents would go to whenever there was any issues. One thing that, you know, I struggled with, especially when I was younger, is, you know, a lot of pressure was put on me to be the best in the, best in the family. You know, as a first child, there was a lot of high expectation on me to, uh, you know, do the best, be the best dancer. I, I was a competitive dancer for 15 years. Um, be the best at school, have the best friends, have the best relationships. It, it just, that was kind of my raise, how I was raised. So, yeah, it, you know, kind of made me into a bit of a perfectionist somebody who had very, very high expectations of myself. And I put a lot of pressure on myself um, at a very, very early young age. So, you know, I had a pretty early traumatic experience when I was uh, growing up. You know, I was in a bullying experience where I was with, a, you know, involved with a group of girls who were, you know, my best friends for about 15 years, 16 years. And they decided one day right before graduation, we no longer want you in the group and we no longer want you as a friend. So, that bullying experience was devastating. I didn't go to my graduation. I didn't go to my prom. I didn't, you know, even exams. I wrote my exams in a different room because I was so intimidated by these girls. And it was something that I suppressed for years after that, um, that I'm actually just recently dealing with, is the, the devastation through that one experience that I had with them. You know, I was devastated. I was young. I was impressionable. And it made me into... Um, although it was one of the worst situations, it also kind of made me into, you know, the, the person I was going forward in my, you know, in my future. So, you know, throughout my life, I guess I can look back and I, you know, I realized I definitely had some boundary issues and that started when I was very young. You know, I was successful, confident, I was determined growing up, but I had those boundaries issues and it was getting worse in my personal life. Um, you know, in my early 20s, I was pretty much a workaholic. I mean, I was determined to prove to anybody in my past that I could do this all on my own. And I think especially from just the way I was raised and compared to even the, the situation I went with the girls, I felt like I had to prove something to somebody. Um, so that kind of, you know, that's kind of a little bit of a idea of, you know, how I was raised and how, you know, some of the situations that I went through, you know, at a younger age. And also when people are listening and we've discussed on earlier episodes that this can happen to anyone. Narcissistic abuse, domestic abuse can happen to anyone, no matter what your social economic status is. And you were someone who was uh, independent, well off on your own, a great career yeah, and confident in it and had no uh, problems financially in any sort of way. And it's something a lot of people wouldn't think that someone like you from the outward would think that this could happen to you. And just for everyone out there, I, this is, you know, a story as well as this can happen to anyone. So, yeah. I, I mean, like I, I, that was my goal. My determination was, you know, I'm going to be successful in my career. You know, I bought my first house at 26. I flipped it. I bought an investment property. I worked my way up in the company. You know, I was a very confident independent woman and um yeah it, it absolutely can happen to anybody you know narcissistic people tend to like we had discussed they go for um you know good solid strong people there is no uh there nobody is off off game for them if that makes sense 
you're proof of it. I mean, in, in a strange way, you, this, this person we're, we're about to discuss is, is about to come in in Act 1 and take your trust and yeah. uh, it knows exactly how to gain your trust. So uh, Act 1 is all about trust. And now I'm just going to, again, remove myself from the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I met my narc. Well, the, my ex-narcissist um, on a dating app, actually. I met him on Bumble. Um, I was new to the dating scene, um, for the online dating scene. You know, I saw a lot of people around me who were getting married, and they met people online. So I thought, you know what? Like, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Why not just give it a shot, see what goes? I mean, what, what could go wrong? If, I mean, if I don't if I meet somebody, great. If I don't, then whatever. So I was going on a few dates. Um but after the dates, I just wasn't feeling it. I didn't feel a, a connection or chemistry with some of the guys I was going out with. So I was starting to feel a little bit discouraged. Maybe this just isn't the route for me. So I remember actually after one date, one night that I was on with somebody, I remember going home and saying, I'm done with this. Like, I can't keep going on these dates and not feeling anything. It's, it's becoming very discouraging. When I noticed that my app had a match with my app. We first started talking, you know, he seemed like a really great guy, very genuine through um, our text message conversations. Like we had a lot of things in common, you know, we wanted the same thing future. So I thought, okay, maybe this actually is a genuine good guy. We kept talking during the week. We finally set up a phone call. Um, he was incredibly charismatic, um, but almost a little bit too much where there was points in the conversation where I'm like, I don't think I'm getting a word in here. Like, and I'd even joke about him with that. And he would just say, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm nervous. And I'm excited to talk to you. You know, I remember talking about his career and him, you know, basically saying that, oh, you know, it was my job. I just, you know, now I don't feel anything when I see somebody die. And I, you know, things don't bother anymore, don't bother me anymore. And suffering doesn't bother me. And I remember making a little joke with him and saying, like, well, are you a sociopath? Like, because that seems very sociopathic behavior that you don't have feelings and you don't care. And I remember him laughing and saying, oh, no, you know, it's, it's, it's just because of my job. It's just because of the, some of the things I see, right? So I kind of brushed it off. Um, I remember setting up a date for that weekend, and uh, we had actually just met at a local bar. So we first met, I remember immediately, I didn't feel like that immediate, sorry, when I first met him, I didn't feel an immediate spark. I didn't feel a real strong connection. There was a bit of attraction, but it was, wasn't immediate. So I was a little bit disappointed, and I wasn't sure if he was my type. But again, that side of me is like, oh, just give it a shot. Like, you never know. Just stop being so um, so picky with people. So I, yeah, we, we sat down. We got talking. You know, he's building, you know, my trust. He's telling me, you know, he's, you know, suffered with anxiety. You know, he's had a problem with drinking in his past. You know, his, you know, he's had a lot of family issues. We're just opening up with one another. And I'm feeling like, okay, maybe he trusts me. Maybe this is a, you know, maybe he is a good person. He's been through a lot of hard times. Um, you know, we did have that, that connection was slowly being developed. And I guess there was a side of me that felt some empathy towards him or like he's been hard done by. And that I, you know, I, he was just hitting that side of me, that empathy. Um, so by the end of the night, I remember like we're, holding hands across the table, you know, he's telling me, you know, how many kids he wants to have and that I'm so special and he's been waiting to meet a girl like me. And I guess where I was in that point in my life, I, or at that point in, you know, yeah, in my life, um, I felt, you know, validated by that. And I felt like the things that I really wanted were, you know, okay, finally somebody's talking to me about kids. Finally somebody's talking to me about wanting to get married one day. And, you know, I'm, I'm a 32-year-old 32, 32 woman who's looking for those types of things. You know, I'm finally feeling like maybe I met somebody who's, who's genuine and who wants the same things as me. So, again, yeah, trust was gained during that even that first meeting and just his, his openness. And, you know, he had talked to me about his – his mom and dad being very hard on him growing up and that his brother was the golden child and he was the, uh, the black sheep of the family. And, you know, again, that one, just that conversation kept coming up again and again in the relationship. Obviously it, it actually played a huge role in it um, in some of our big issues. Um, so, yeah, he mentioned he was looking for the one, he wanted to get married, he wanted to have kids, you know, how much, he knew all the things that I loved, he knew I loved my, I had told him I, how much I love my family, how much I love my niece and my nephew, he knew how, 
he knew how important family was to me and that that was everything to me. And I had told him I, from the very beginning that anybody I get involved with, my, that, that relationship with my family is so important and it's key to the relationship being successful is, you know, can everybody get along? Yeah. So he was, he was very much, I mean, very much mirroring what I wanted at this point. You know, he was making me feel like he was very genuine, sincere. And I mean, I didn't really at that point have any reason to doubt him. Um, but I will be honest, within that first meeting, there were a few red flags that did come out. You know, he spoke very negatively of a lot of his past ex, exes. The, um, he said he was engaged a few years prior, and she, he compared her to the devil and, you know, said she was a terrible person and that she cheated on him and she just did him wrong. And she did not tell. She turned out to be completely different than what she said she was. And I think he even said she was nar- a narcissist. Like, even he was playing into that. And I remember, again, playing into my empathy side where I thought, oh, well, how awful. Like, this, here's this guy that wants this future with a family and he's getting, you know, hurt left, center, and right by all of these people. Um, so, so yeah, for, you, for you... At this point, these are the, for everyone listening uh, and who has either never experienced this or has experienced this, this is where your trust is fully complete, where one, we have a firefighter, check, yeah. here's a profession. Yeah. Number two, yeah. this person has used the victim card in one mm-hmm. way to gain the empathy in you. So now you're feeling for him as if, not that he needs to be fixed but uh, or, or to pity him, but you're, you're feeling for how he grew up. Boom, he's got you, number two. Three, the big one, the mirroring. The mirroring he's done here is probably expert because he's taken what you yep. have said, he's learned from it, and he can probably tell every time he's playing that card and he's throwing yeah. a new one out there. Oh, kids. Oh, look how she reacted there. This. Mm-hmm. Look how she reacted there. Boom. Okay. Yeah, I got her. I got her. Yeah. And that one, yeah. I, I assume, was probably the biggest of the three. Oh, the mirroring. Absolutely. He was portraying himself to be every single thing that I wanted. And especially um, the, the, like the family uh, the family aspect, kids, you know, because you're, you're a certain age and he could probably yeah. see that, you know, this is the age people want to have kids uh, yeah. along those lines. And it was really, um, he really hit you exactly where he needed to hit to get that final bit of like extreme trust that now he has you here. And now I guess act two would be able to begin where he would test your boundaries, see how far he can take things before love bombing happens, devaluing and really create the fog of control of fear, obligation and guilt. So I guess that would happen next, correct? Yes. So, yeah, I guess, you know, like you had said prior, he was a master manipulator. Like he knew, he, he, this is years of experience. This isn't just, you know, he's not new to the game. He knew what he was doing. He knew, he knew my vulnerabilities and he knew my weaknesses and he knew, um, the things that were no like a no go for me that I wasn't going to tolerate in a relationship. Very very early on, this wasn't just oh you know six months down the road I'm going to tell you this is my these are where I'm, what I fear. He knew probably within the first date or two. Yeah, he you gave him an early blueprint of what he needed to say and how he needed yeah. to act. Yeah, like I spelled it out for him, and then he basically took that information and did exactly what I had told him would hurt me. Do you know what I'm, you know, it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's crazy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I can go into this a little bit more as well as like, you know, after that, we kind of, we set this a second date up. I remember, um, you know, this is where some of the boundary pushing started to really happen. Um, the second date he set up, he said, let's have it at my house. Again, a bit boundary pushing for me because I'm somebody who's like, okay, maybe that's a little bit too soon. Like, We've only gone on one date. Um, you know, maybe we need to go do some more stuff outside of the house before that. But uh, he had a really good way of suckering me in and, and um, making it seem like his intentions were pure in everything he did. So anyways, I agreed to it. You know, I ended up going over after work um, one day. And I remember walking in to his house. And again, let's keep in mind he's known me. He's met me once. He was all over me. Um, he, I didn't even have a moment to digest even what his house looked like. He had me, you know, picked up, swinging me around the house. It was very overwhelming. So, yeah, it was just 
he was always just too much. There was just too much. And it was almost just like he was doing that. It, it was, I'll be honest with you, it was sort of creepy. And almost like an, I look back on it now and think like it, there was a bit of an obsession to it. Like he was obsessed. But anyways, we end, I ended up we ended up talking for a few hours, and you know, of course, a lot of the conversation was focused in on me and you know my desires, and what I wanted. I'm sure he's sitting there just learning, you know, exactly what I want. And um, yeah, by the end of the night, um, you know, we did. I did end up staying the night with him. And again, that's that's not really like me, but for some reason, that did happen. And I remember. Waking up the next morning and we, we talked for hours and I, I remember feeling like maybe I found, yeah, like it seems like this is genuine. Like, yeah, there are red flags here and there, but I'm going to ignore them. I'm going to look past them and I'm just going to keep going with this because I, I still feel a connection. And here we are talking in bed for hours like it, it felt right for in the most twisted way. I remember before I left his house, we had coffee and I remember thing basically you know I loved we we're just talking about things in general I said how I love to go for drives during the day I'm sorry on the weekends and go and look at houses and it's just always been something I love to do I mean I love real estate and I love looking at property and I remember him looking at me dead in the eyes and saying this is how I know we're supposed to be together and I remember thinking like okay like I don't even know if I'm a hundred percent in this like this is a this is the, the third the sorry the second time I'm meeting you it feels a little bit too soon but again the dream is still there I'm still in the back of my mind thinking okay Jen just just give this an opportunity to develop allow it allow yourself to give somebody a chance and to trust somebody and to think that somebody's intentions are pure for once right so yeah I mean and that kind of plays into the whole relationship is the fact that he never gave me an opportunity to figure out my true feelings for him early on from the get-go um, I can't even say I was love bombed. It was just like I was, it was love bombed almost seems too gentle. It was almost like I just was like love tsunami with all of this information and how wonderful I was and how beautiful I was and how fantastic. And I was this dream girl and I was this everything he was looking for. Well, I'm so, actually, I'm actually going to compare it to when there is a, a, there's a hacker in in in, yeah. in the world of hacking something there's called a ddos attack and a ddos attack is when an extreme amount of computers that hackers have set up attack an actual uh server and the mm -hmm. the server is just overwhelmed completely yeah. by all of what is going on and then the the virus is able to sneak in and do the damage that it needs to do he's done a version here of a ddos attack on you which is just overwhelming to the point where you don't even know what's kind of going on and mm -hmm. uh it's just so overwhelming that he's been able to enter yeah like i i consider myself a somewhat of a guarded person and very private and it takes a time for people to warm up. I take, it takes a little bit of time for people to warm up, like I, for me to warm up to people and for, pick, for people to great up for me to gain, you know, for people to gain my trust. It just, it, that's just from past experiences and past trauma. That's how I have been. So the fact that he could go in and do all of this and um, yeah, he, the only way he could do it is by overwhelming me and just, it was too much. And I was completely in a love fog, and I didn't know what was left from right. And I just thought, okay, well, I'm gonna, I have to keep going. I felt like there was always this side of me that just was behind this little voice in my head that just said, just keep going, keep trying, keep seeing. Maybe, maybe you'll, you know, maybe this is the person for you. Um, so the, technically, yeah. this is where Act Two, Act One would end, and Act Two would begin. I was premature with my Act Two before. That's Okay, that's all right. It's, it's a confusing one. It, there's a lot going on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess after that date, there was just a lot of, like, you know, I know you're the one for me. Even just the fact that he kept saying, like, I know we're supposed to be together. And, you know, I, no one, you don't ever have to, should ever have to say, I know we're supposed to be together. It should be, be a very much a mutual, a mutual thing. Um so yeah, going into basically, you know, Act Two finally. Um, oh, actually, you know, before Act Two begins, and sorry to confuse everyone, there's one story that I want you to tell, which would be part of Act One, which is also about trust, and that's the key story. 
Yeah. So sorry, I'm, I'm skipping ahead a little. That's there. my um, fault. I'm I'm being a bad host. <laughs> but yeah, two or three weeks in, he sends me a message saying, "Hey, I've got a surprise for you when you come over tonight. Um, I've got something for you." Okay, so I'm thinking, okay, what? Well, maybe he's got like tickets to a movie. Uh, I don't know, like what? What you know? Maybe who knows what it could possibly be. So here I am at work thinking all the day, the whole day of what the possibility of he has for me. He wouldn't tell me. So I get there, and we. Wa- I remember walking into his living room, and on his dining room table, he had a key and a book that was still in, in its wrapping. Actually, two books that was still in the wrapper still. Um, the five love languages. So he said, well, this one's for me. This one's for you. I want you to read this. I think we really need to be on the same page. If we really want this to work, we need to understand each other's love languages. And by the way, here's the key to my house. You know, I fully trust you. You come and go as you want. My house is your house. Um, you know, I really want this to work because I can see myself marrying you and having a future with you. So I just, I, I know it's right. So because I feel like it's right, I just, I want you to have it. And I mean, I, I really did like the guy at this point. Um, I mean, for the few, first few weeks we had together, which sounds crazy, they, they were good. And I, you know, I, I did enjoy my time with him, but I don't know if you were at key level yet. It just seems too early. But, you know, I guess that was definitely one of his ways of grabbing my attention and at that point thinking, well, this guy has pure intentions. I mean, look at him. He's giving me a key to his house. Like, there's no possible way that he could have any other, you know, girls on the side or anything if he's, you know, that fear of cheating, it can't be there if he's giving me a key to his house. And that's why I think it's an interesting story, especially for other people to hear about that key. In a way, it's a a reverse trust uh, game that he played. He is showing trust in you with giving you the key to the home. The why would you suspect anything would be happening in this home? You know, it, that, that's kind of what he was trying to do by, by doing that. And that's a really interesting tactic that someone would use because, uh, you know, in a weird way, it's like a reverse projection, I guess I would maybe call it, where if I, if I give this to her now, then why would she suspect? It's, a, it's a, like very much a magician's trick of a sleight of hand. He's giving yeah. you this as like, look this way, but you know, I'm, uh, it's an illusion. It's kind of like when David Copperfield makes, the, a long time ago, he'd make the Statue of Liberty disappear when you're standing right in front of it. That's what he did with that key when he gave it to you. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a smoke screen. It's just a way to say, you know, here you go. Trust me. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about. And then kind of on the side, go, ha ha sucker. You're an idiot. Now I'm going, you know what I mean? Like it was just, it was just an illusion. Um, so yeah, I, I would honestly say though, my, at this point, I really, and it's, it's very early on and it sounds crazy to say it, but I, I really trusted him at this point And I didn't think that his, his intentions were bad. So I, I kept going with it. So yeah, that's, I think where the part of just trust was officially built was when, you know, that key was given to me, which is a crazy analogy. Even on your, one of your posts that I saw is that, you know, literally physically giving me the key to, to, you know, for all the trust. I thought of you when I made that. Did you? Okay. (laughs) I saw it and I went, Oh my God, it's like my ex right there. So. So now I guess we are officially into act two. And again, I apologize to everyone that I've been, all over the place uh, this episode. Um, <laughs> but continue. Act two, devaluation, yeah. the fog, and testing of boundaries. Yeah. So, I mean, again, at this point, I I still trust him. I still think he, um, you know, we, the one thing I want to establish too is that, um, you know, going on within the next month or two, our, we did have a lot of good times together. Um, I don't want... I want that to be established is that, you know, we did have a lot of good times together. We did spend a lot of time together. Um, you know, we, I was spending about four or five days at his house in a row. Um, you know, it's, it was, it's the weirdest thing to me is that being with him sometimes felt very comfortable. And I had to question that after the relationship ended because I'm going, why do I feel so comfortable with this person? But, um, it's, I think that has to do a lot with the mirroring that he was doing with me. So, yeah, t- testing the boundaries. I would say, you know, he was very controlling. 
like I said, dominating my time and calling me at work every day and texting me all throughout the day. One of the boundary testers for me is he started to bring up girls a lot, um, a lot of female friends. But they were just friends. There was, you know, there was nothing going on. They, you know, he wasn't attracted to them. There was nothing going on there. He had no feelings. They were not his type that I had nothing to worry about. So one of the biggest te- boundary testers very early on in the relationship, I would say, is when he had mentioned, hey, listen, I've uh, got a girl, just a friend. You know, she's got cancer. There's no attraction there. You know, she's going through a lot of hard times. I just I w- wanted to take her to the movies you know, take her out for lunch. Are you okay with that? Like, are you fine with that? Again, it's probably about three weeks in. And I remember thinking, okay, this is a, this feels weird because he knows my past and he knows my insecurities, but I'm going to say yes, because it's still early on in the relationship. I mean, if he's had this friendship for years, I'm fine with it. So I let him go. I mean, I keep her in mind because she'll play in the story a little bit later on here, but I would say that was, you know, one of the first boundary pushers that he, uh, you know, where my boundaries had been pushed. Another one, I don't know if he'd call this a boundary push, but it was just something different. He had told me that he, he didn't tell me. He basically wanted to hear from me very early on that I loved him. He wanted to hear that come out of my mouth. Again, it was pushing my boundary because, I wasn't ready to say those words yet. You know, we've only known each other. This is, we're talking still about the, about the three weeks to a month, maybe a month mark at this point. It's too early on. I, I didn't know how I felt about him. Um, yes, I really liked him, but I don't know if I, I couldn't say that I was in love with him at that point. So I kept kind of dodging it with him and he kept pushing back on me. And um, he said, well, I guess I'm just going to have to work harder to get you to say it. And I'm like, that's, no, like this should be just something that's genuine. That's just said when it feels right. There shouldn't have to be any forcefulness in it. But um, so he kind of tapered off with it, even though he kind of kept throughout the relation, especially early on saying like, you know, we love each other or I love, you know, you, I know you love me. I know you feel this way about me. So of course he gets me in a vulnerable position, vulnerable position one night. We're laying in bed together at his house and um, and just about to fall asleep. And he looks over at me and he says, I love you. And I'm vulnerable at this point. Like, I've got nowhere to go. Like, I'm, well, I do, but, like, we're in bed. And I kind of just, I set it back. But it, I didn't, it wasn't genuine on my end. But it was his way of pushing me to say those words. And it wasn't in a way where it was a genuine way of us saying, I love you to each other. It was just for his way to say, like, I love you. For me to say, I love you. And then for him to say, hey, now I've got you. Like, now I have control, Right. Again, there was just a lot of boundaries being pushed and a lot of forcefulness on his end. I just felt like he was always trying to test my boundaries, but at the same time, he loved Bob me so much that, I, I, again, I didn't have an opportunity to really say to him, hey, like, listen, like, this is going too fast. This is too much too soon because at the same time, it felt good and it felt right to me for it to be happening. And I felt like finally I'm going to, I'm meeting somebody who's so, so into me and it's so all about me that maybe I just need to keep going. So a lot of the things he also would say to me is he, you know, he knew cheating was a big one for me. So we'd always, you know, he pretended to be somebody who would never cheat on me, you know, say, oh, I'm so loyal. You know, you never have to worry about anything. Um, I would never do that to you. You know, all my other firefighter fighter friends, they cheat on their girlfriends and their wives, but I'm that exception. Don't worry about me. I would never do that to you. I mean, that was obviously not the case whatsoever. So what I'm going to just kind of get into is a lot of his love bombing started to turn into aggression or he'd have aggression with love bombing. So I'm going to kind of go through a few situations and kind of explain how that came out. So he always, the first situation is when I actually first met his friends. And this was the first time where I really kind of saw a different side of him, where I actually kind of grew to be a little bit fearful of him. So before meeting his friends, he spoke of his friends very negatively, um, kind of like he was above them or like he felt like he was, you know, too good to be their friends, which I always thought was a little bit uh, arrogant, to be honest. So when we, you know, when I first met his friends, I kind of just jumped into the group. I, you know, started talking to the girls and, you know, just getting to know them. And all of a sudden he kept coming up from behind me and aggressively massaging my shoulders. Like 
not in a playful, cute way. Like I'm talking aggressive, like full on aggression. And he was hurting me. And I remember telling him like, stop, like, why are you doing this? And the other girls that, you know, are sitting there like looking at him, like, what are you doing? And here I am, like, I'm 110 pounds. I'm a petite little feminine girl. I'm not, like, that tomboy type that wants to be treated that way. So I kept looking at him and being like, can you please stop? And he looked at me and would say, oh, what? So you'll be affectionate with me in private, but you won't do it in person? And I'm like, that's, that's not affection. You're being aggressive. You're hurting me. So I remember that whole night, like he'd go off and he would talk with his group of friends and I mean, not even talk. He would sit there and stare at a wall while his other friends communicated because he was incredibly socially awkward. I remember just feeling like, I hope this guy doesn't come up again. Like I kept looking over my shoulder because he was embarrassing me when he was doing it and he was hurting me. So I didn't want him to come up and do it again. So that was like my first real experience of seeing like, Ooh, this is not, it, it didn't sit well with me. But what happened is then we ended up going back to his house that night and his way to obviously, you know, deal with everything was the love bomb again. And, you know, how I handled myself so well with his friends and how I was his dream girl and, oh, you know, you're probably going to be the girl I'm going to marry one day. And I just, again, he took a situation that where I started to get my guard up and I started, I think he could tell I was getting a little bit, you know, uh, my eyes were being opened a bit. So then it was his way of coping and dealing with it was just, okay, well, let's just slam her with more love bombing to kind of distract her from what just happened. And specifically, he uses the, uh, I guess, the, the marriage aspect of everything, or at least the future, future planning in it. And that's a big, obviously a big thing for you as far as how your trust was built, that that would settle you down. Yes. I mean, he played into that constantly, right? Let's bring up a family, let's bring up children, and that's going to keep her keep her going, right? Um, so, I mean, again, just another example, too, with more of his aggression was just, you know, I met another one of his friends, and, you know, he had one of his buddies over for pizza one night, and, you know, we're all sitting and talking. You know, usually I carry the conversation most when it, we're around other people because, he, again, he was very socially awkward, and he just didn't know. He couldn't carry a conversation properly with in a group setting, it was just, it was like foreign to him. When he did carry a conversation though with, with me around, it was to make little jabs at me. Like, oh, you know, when she's here, you know, she, her hair sheds so much. I have to spend like an hour cleaning it out of the, the shower drain and making little jokes and jabs at me. And I remember his guy friend looking over at me and saying like, I hope you're giving it back to this guy. Like he, I could tell he was getting, um, upset with how my ex was talking about me or talking to me. So again, it was another thing where it's just like he had to just poke, like he had to poke at me. But then again, at the end of the night, when his friend left, let's love bomb. Oh, you're the best thing. My friend loved you. You're wonderful. You know, you're the, I just, I can't wait to have a future with you. Like that was, again, he could tell that I was getting agitated. So he had to deal with it by love bombing again. Did you ever get the sense that his friends didn't like him at all? Oh Yeah. Yeah. Did they ever say anything I, I, to you? Um, no, but you can always tell by a group, by people's looks on their faces that they were super kind and wonderful to me, but I can almost see the look in their eyes of, as if, like, what are you doing, girl? Like, do you know who this person really is? Which, at the time, didn't clue into me, but obviously after the fact, I really realized that there probably was some, like, why is this girl putting herself through this? Or we know who the real guy is. This isn't going to last. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just, you know, very, even very early on, he was very much somebody who he, he had to, there was a, a situation where he had to implant thoughts in my head where he would tell me very early on, you are very important to me. And every text message that we had and any time we said goodnight, in bold letters, you are very important to me. Every conversation, that's how it had to end. And at first you think it's sweet and you think it's cute. But then after a while, you know, when somebody's like saying it all the time, it's almost like they're constantly trying to tell you, ha don't look anywhere else. You're very important to me. Like, you got nothing to worry about here. It's a slow, like, it's a slow subliminal message. You don't realize it's yep. a subliminal because it's right in front of your face. 
but the more it's said, the more it's imprinting in you. Yeah. Like I remember the first time he actually said it out loud to me, we were, I was in his bed and he pulled me over towards him and held on to me tight in my ear. He whispered those words. And I remember feeling like, ew, like it just doesn't feel right. But at the same time, you feel so overwhelmed with the fact that somebody adores you or you think adores you so much that you're, you're thinking, oh, okay, well maybe this is just the way that it's supposed to feel. I, I don't know. It just, it felt very forceful and almost kind of like he was trying to brainwash me into those words, like repeat them constantly over and over again. And, and maybe I can, uh, you know, it will just, it'll make her stay. There's, she's never going to leave if she thinks that she's so important to me. So, yeah, I, I guess that kind of trickles into, you know, very early on he planned a trip for us together. Um, I'd say probably within the first month he's like, oh, let's go to my parents' condo in Florida. I'll pay for everything. I'll take care of everything. And I'm like, I'm good. Like, I, I, I work. I can I can take care of my own stuff. Like, just tell me how much it's going to cost. I can I can handle it. And so anyways, we ended up going, and um, I'll be honest, the, the first half of the trip was was fine. We had a good time together. I mean, I, again, like I want to stress, there was a, there was some normalcy to the relationship, and um, it wasn't all chaos all over the place. There were moments and in, in sections in that relationship where it was actually very normal, and it's very much like a relationship. I remember we were at his parents, obviously back at his parents' condo. It was down by the beach, and he... He had noticed that a guy was checking me out at the beach, and I guess he ran up to me to basically tell me, oh, yeah, you're never going to believe some guy was looking at you, and it's almost like he got a little bit of a thrill out of it or something. Again, strange. He, he did that consistently in our relationship. And I remember as we were walking back to the condo after being on the beach, I said to him, listen, like, you're not upset about that because he's starting to get a little bit quiet that somebody was looking at me or somebody was checking me out. And I didn't want him to, like, listen, you're not bothered by it, are you? And, you know, that I'm, I don't want, like, who cares what other people think of me? Like, I'm with you. I'm happy with you. Like, I, I want to be with you. Like, don't be insecure about it or anything. You have nothing to worry about. And I remember him looking at me saying, you know, I can get any girl I want. My cooking can get me any girl I want. Like, and I remember it just, again, the tone of it was, was such aggression and was looking at me like, you're so replaceable. Don't even worry about it. Like I can get somebody at the drop of a hat. And I remember like my heart dropping and feeling like, wow, here's some person that who's love bonding me so much. And they basically just tell me that I am easily replaceable and don't worry about it. I can get any girl I want. So I'm upset. We go back up to the condo, back to his parents, up the room and he knows I'm being he knows that you know I feel differently at this point and he knows that my, I'm acting strange I'm a little bit more quiet and you know he goes no what's wrong what's wrong I said listen I said I just need to go for a walk I just want to go for a walk I want to kind of digest a few things and my way of coping and my way of dealing with situations is usually to walk it off and just figure it out and come back with you know more of a clear head but he refused. He wanted to know what was going on. And that's where I really stood up for myself in that moment. And I said, listen, like what you did downstairs and what you said, it really hurt me. And you know, my past and you know, the things that have hurt, you know, hurt me deeply and being, you know, being cheated on. And I don't understand why you had to go there. And of course, back into the, to the whole love uh, bombing and just saying, you know, don't, oh babe, don't worry. Like, you know, I, I never, I'm sorry. I never want to hurt you. You know how special and how important you are to me and you're the world to me. And I, and I would never, I'd never hurt you and all this stuff. So again, it was brushed off, but I would say that at that point, there was a shift because I, I stood up for myself in that situation. And that's where I could tell going forward in the relationship, he was going to start to ramp things up a little, a lot more. And he was going to start to gun in that, the things that were my fears. Um, so yeah, came home from the trip, um, you know, and then within a few weeks after, I'm sorry, probably within a week or so after that, he had made the suggestion of meeting my family. And keep in mind at this point too, he had brought up his family. I guess he wanted to have me for Easter dinner. And he said, listen, my family is not ready to meet you yet. Um, they're not over my ex. They're not over the situation. So they're just not comfortable with meeting somebody so early on. And I thought, okay, that's fine. Like, whatever. It's still early on in the relationship. Um, obviously, they had a good connection with your ex. 
So therefore, like, what a, you know, that's actually a good thing. Um, but yeah, then it was kind of, so was, there was a shift. All of a sudden now he wanted to meet my family. So yeah, I was super excited. I finally thought, okay, obviously this really, you know, the trip went well. He wants to meet my family. Things are, are headed in a good direction. So this next situation was definitely, I would say, the most eye-opening experience for me where it really, like, it, it really bothered me. And it really, I saw the mask, you know, the narcissistic mask that they, you know, that mask that they wear. This is where it really fully dropped for me for the first time. My mom is the type of person where she's incredibly loving and she's incredibly, sometimes a bit too much with the emotional, like she gets way too excited. And I think she was just very excited for me. So during that night, my mom started to snap a few photos of them, just randomly, photos of us, photos of him, just out of excitement, no big deal. So night comes to an end. Everybody's saying goodbye. Um, I thought the night went pretty decently. He was acting a little bit odd during the night. He was a little bit more quiet than usual, but I didn't really make anything of it. So get into his, we leave my parents, uh, sorry, my brother's house, get into his truck. And just before the door can even shut, he looked over at me. And it was like this look in his eyes, like, you're going to get it, look. Like, basically looked at me and said, if you're, just to let you know, if your mom ever looks at me that way or ever, sorry, ever snaps shots like that, me, shots of me like that ever again, she's going to have a problem and we're going to have a problem. And I remember going like, what? Like, what do you mean shots? If your mom kept taking pictures, you know how much I don't like people taking pictures of me. How dare she? If you don't say anything about this, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going, like, and in, in that moment, what I'm feeling is, okay, A, I'm afraid of him. Like, I feel fearful of him because he's being very aggressive with me, and he's basically yelling at me at this point. Two, I'm afraid of losing him because now it's a matter of he's not getting along with my family. Like, he's already finding fault. So what if, he, this does, what if he's done, he doesn't want to be with this type of, be around, me, around my family? And then... Three, that, like, what if he doesn't, can't handle situations with my family going forward, right? So I had all these thoughts going through my head, and honestly, I was devastated. I was terrified. I had no idea what just happened because I just saw a completely different side of this person that was so aggressive. So we end up going back to my house, and again, by that point, I'm just, like, I'm beside myself, and... We walk into my house, and he starts hugging me and kissing me. It's like all of a sudden this shift, this snap, like, like nothing happened. Meanwhile, I'm standing there, and I'm absolutely devastated. Like, I have no idea what just happened. So we end up going straight to bed because I couldn't have handled any more conversation with him anyway. Um, so now you're, you're, you're just like, you're confused. You yeah. have fear. You yeah. feel obligated to do a lot of the things he's wanting you to do. Yeah. Like, like you're programmed, you're controlled, he's used aggression, then the love bombing, he touches your boundaries with, uh, he's still using the mirroring, and now in a certain way, is it kind of like he's isolating you from your family? Yeah, like he knows, or he's at least targeting the things that I love, and that I told him I really value at this, you know, from a very, from very early on, he knew that. You know, I stood up for me. I find it odd and, and different that, you know, I stood up for myself and then all of a sudden all these like little things start happening, right? So, yeah, he, you know, he was targeting my family and I felt, I felt a confused, I felt a mix of defensiveness for my mom and my dad and my family. I'm sorry, my brother and my sister in law. Like they were nice enough to have this guy over and all of a sudden now he's acting this way. And then I also felt defensive towards him because I'm going, well, here's this person I care about and they, you know, my mom did something that bothered him, and I don't want to lose him over this. So there's just my head is very conflicted. So at th at this point, like the fog, the fear, obligation, and guilt is supremely secured. You know, at this point, I'm just I'm anxious. Like I don't know where where to turn. And you know, here I am telling my family like one thing, and I'm saying, oh no, he's great. Like things are going well because at moments they were. But then I would get hit with these little things here, these little bombs of, like, aggression here and there where I didn't know what was going on. I was very 
very confused, um, you know, and I just, anytime I started to catch on, I felt like that was the point where he would then feel that his way to resolve it was just to tell me how wonderful I was. Um, so, you know, he was a pro, he was a true pro. He knew at this point, at this point, he knew exactly what he could and couldn't do. He knew exactly yeah. what he could he could do to you, and he knew exactly what to say to reel you back in. Yeah, here I am thinking that this guy has real good motives for the relationship, and meanwhile, it's it's completely not that way. His his motives were very like sadistic and insidious at this point. Like he just wanted to, you know, looking back on the relationship now, he was looking to destroy me, and he was looking to use anything that I held with value and love and regard, and he was looking to destroy it. And he um, and he liked control like he really it seems like here when you're listening to all this it seems like he really like got off on the control aspect of everything i mean the the story that you know that involves your family and the pictures that in itself the way he acted was probably like a a child you know and that's what it reminds me of when you were telling the story in that, like, he, he's in control here. He's calling the shots. He's doing what he wants. And he's being able yeah. to control you in public, which is why it's interesting when you said in private he acts in one way, but in public he's getting you to act in these other ways, which is pretty interesting to see, like, mm-hmm. maybe in his mind he's like, oh, I can do whatever I want behind closed doors. That's one thing. But if I can control her in public, look at that. This is how that makes me feel. Yeah. Like, even just. I think is when the, the relationship just started to, to nosedive at that point. And so this is when that, this is, I guess, when Act Three really begins. Oh yeah, this is like when you're just getting your your. He at this point just doesn't give a shit, and it's yeah, th- so this be, is yeah, brazen acts doesn't care, and yeah. the end. Yes. So. Keep in mind, at this time, we're still seeing each other four or five times a week, but there was a huge shift in his personality. He basically, at that point, said, like, okay, well, you know, like, I guess I'll see you on the next weekend. Like, I'm going to be working during the week, and I'm going to be busy with the house renovation. So, you know, you go do your thing, and I'll go do my thing, and we'll see each other on the weekends. Which, again, is not like him. We were together all the time, and um, it, it just felt, something felt off. Um, you know, he'd make little jokes or remarks saying, aha, yeah, like, you know, something about being in a dead end relationship or he'd hear something on TV and saying, ha, yeah, like kind of like what we are in and then go, oh, don't, uh, don't worry. I'm just kidding. Like, I didn't really mean that. I'm just joking. Right. Just little, little digs here and there or little things to make my mind, to get my mind going. Um, still though, I think he knew, I think he was, you know, smart enough in his, his ways to know that he still had to do trickles of love bomb here and there to keep me because. He couldn't full go into devaluation mode because I, I think he knew I was, I was a bit smarter than that. And I may have just been like, no, 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 like we're done then at that, at that moment. So, um, yeah, you know, at this point, I, I'm, I'm feeling quite isolated from my family. I, I'm feeling like I can't have these conversations or discussions because they, they see the relationship in a very different way. Um, I'm starting to feel more anxious around him. He's amping up these remarks that are making me question the relationship. I mean, I'm not seeing him as much. Um, He brings up then at this point, you know, I had known he had, I think very, very early on, I told you about the friend that he had took out for um, to the movies and for something to eat. The girl that he said had cancer. So during this, this phase, this act right here, um, I had asked him, I said like, you know, how's she doing? How's she feeling? You know, you haven't really brought her up much. And I remember him looking at me and saying, like, uh, yeah, I think she liked me. We don't talk anymore. And I'm going, like, this is somebody that you, you know, were, were going in, just going, being, being very descriptive about the type of cancer that they had and how, how caring you were and how strong of a person you thought they were. So that's where things started to, like, click. Like, I don't think that, like, who knows if that's what, if she even had that or if he made that up so that he could go out with her. I guess the final week prior to the final end, um, I just knew something wasn't right. My gut was going. I was literally at this point starting to get an actual physical reaction from being around this person. Like, 
there was maybe two or three times where I had to run to the bathroom to throw up because I felt so anxious and so sick. Um, and I, again, I'm, I'm not somebody who suffers from anxiety or depression or anything like that. Um, I, we all dealt with situational anxiety. But this is different. This was like, I can't even be around him. And he would say things that would get me so anxious that I would have to, you know, jet line it to the bathroom just to, to, you know, get it out of my body, all this anxiety and anxiousness. So, yeah, I remember that week to the week of the end. I remember on the Wednesday him saying, hey, like, listen, I want to, uh, one of, a friend of mine wants to come down, and he had brought him up in the past. So I was like, okay, yeah, go. You know, we're going to come down. He's going to come down. We're going to go for a few drinks. Is that okay? And I remember him saying to him, like, yeah, you don't have to ask for, for, for permission. You go ahead. Like, that's fine. Well, you know, it's just Friday nights we usually spend together, and I just want to have respect for you, and I want to ask and make sure you're okay with it. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. Go do what you got to do. Um, you know, you're allowed to have your friends. I have my friends. That was fine. The Friday night he went out. I went out too. And then the Saturday we had decided to spend Saturday and Sunday together. I go over and I walk into his house and, you know, he's downstairs. He calls up to me and, you know, I'll be up in one minute. So I'm standing there waiting and I'll just, you know, get my shoes off, whatever. He comes upstairs and he walks right past me, like doesn't even make eye contact. And that's not like him. Usually he's more at the door, you know, saying hello. It was almost like he was, like, just completely avoiding me. So I go up to him, and I'm like, oh, hey, like, I'm here. Like, hi. Oh, you even look like you're happy to be here. So he's starting trying to start an argument with me. And I'm thinking, like, no, like, I'm not, not happy. Like, I'm, you just walked right past me. You didn't even acknowledge that I was here. Like, of course I'm going to be a little bit taken back by it. So that just set the tone up and like, I just, it just felt like there was just a shift or a major change with him. And he was at this point just didn't care. And he was just going to be whoever he wanted to be in front of me. And just one thing before, before you continue, just for everyone out there who's been through this or, or knows what we're talking about, the people that don't know what we're talking about, that moment when you knew it had changed, it was like it, something physically happened inside you. You just knew it was over in your mind, probably. You just mm -hmm. you just couldn't see yet how long it would take. But in your mind, did you realize at that moment, like when you you felt that shift, that it was done? You were just waiting to see how. I think it, for me, it was the look, the the walking past me. Um, that's when I knew. Uh oh. Now now I'm just now we're counting down the you know this is coming to an end so i remember waking up monday morning and i drove to work i was only work about 10 minutes away from where he is um and i remember leaving his house and just knowing that there was something was going to happen soon i just knew it again that whole those few days were like my was like just very eye-opening for me so I ended up going to work for the day and I kind of had a game plan. It's, it's time to, to really figure out who this person is. And so I ended up um, finishing work. I ended up texting him and saying, cause he used to get angry. If I didn't text him when work was finished or when I was on my way home, he would text me saying like, I expect you to text me and let me know that you're going home because I don't want to worry about you again, another form of control. Right. Mm -hmm. So I um, texted him. I he ended up saying, oh, yeah, okay, hey, babe, yeah, get home safe, blah, blah, blah. I, for some reason, said I am sticking around where I was and I'm going to go for dinner. So I ended up grabbing a coworker and going and grabbing a bite to eat at a restaurant just down the street from my work and um, shot him a message probably around 6 o'clock saying, hey, I ended up sticking around. Like, um, what are you up to? I didn't get a response. And it was, he didn't respond for maybe about an hour and a half, two hours later. And I remember thinking, that is not like him. Very strange. And I, I just, again, my gut was like, oh, something is off. Like, something's not right here. So he ends up messaging me. And he says, oh, hey, babe, I was just downstairs doing laundry. And my phone was up on the charger. Don't worry. Like, I, uh, 
um, you know, what are you doing for, what are you doing tonight? And what are your plans? Are you going anywhere? Are you going to be doing anything? And I remember thinking, you are not being honest right now. And I don't know why I felt that way. I just did. So I, you know, I had a key at this point and it was very much a relationship where it was a kind of a come and go. And, you know, again, he had always told me, and he made sure to tell anybody she has a key. She can come and go as she pleases. She's never going to find anything. Like he made that known. So I ended up driving to his house because I just had to, I had to do it. I just, again, everything in me was saying, just do it. And I remember on my phone, with you know with my sister-in-law and saying like listen I know something's going on I don't want to feel like a crazy girl here but at the same time like I know something isn't right and I feel like I need to do this and I remember her saying oh well you know probably nothing's wrong you're just overthinking it and he's probably not doing anything I said no like I just feel like something's wrong and I ended up pulling into his driveway and his car is not there and I knew it that was it for me like, it took for me not to see his vehicle in the driveway and to know he never parks in his in his uh, garage because he's always got tools and stuff in there. That's all it took for me to know, lying. Like, I just knew it. So I ended up going inside, and he's not there because I thought maybe in some twisted way he's, like, parked down the street. And, I, I you know, you make up a million excuses in your mind because you don't want to believe the truth at that point. And, uh, yeah, nobody's there to be found. And I remember picking up my phone and sending him a message and saying, your key is in the mailbox. I don't understand why you're lying to me. Because he was pretending to be somewhere where he wasn't. And I knew, like, at that point, I just knew the relationship was done. I told you, once you start lying and starting to start to lie behind my back, it's, it's done. So he ended up messaging me probably within the next 15 minutes. Actually, he called me and saying, it's not what it looks like. It's not what it looks like. And I said, listen, I ended up sticking around because I felt like I needed to actually have a face-to-face with him and and give him, you know, let him hear what I had to say. And um, he ends up coming back. And weirdly enough, because I had went over to a coffee shop before he actually ended up coming home. When I ended up driving back to his house, his door was wide open. Like, he was ready for me to come in. Like, he knew. He knew that something was going to come out of this one. I remember walking into his house and him looking at me like a deer in headlights. And just like he knew, he was caught red-handed. And I said, listen, I said, what is the one thing I told you in this relationship? It's just never lie to me. And you're lying. And I know that something is up. I said, where were you tonight? Like, where? And I remember him looking at me and saying, I was out with a girl and there was no, uh, nothing, just straight face. I was out with a girl. I was out with somebody. And I said, like, I'm trying to look for answers. Like, were you on a date? Yeah, I was on a date with somebody. Like I was out with someone. And I said, okay. I said, well, firstly, we're done. Like the relationship is over. And then I remember him saying, I remember asking the question, like, so on the Friday, were you with any, like, what was going on? Just like, were you actually with guy friends? No, I was on a date. I was with somebody. And that's when I just, I, you know, I told him, I said, I think you are an absolutely an awful person. I think you're a horrible person. You totally betrayed my trust. You went behind my back. You've been seeing other girls. Like, we're in a relationship here. And I said, like, I never want to see you again, and I think you're a pathological liar. And that whole time, he sat there, no emotion, said, the only thing he kept saying to me is, I'm sorry, I don't want to hurt you, I'm sorry, and I know this is going to be the biggest thing I'm ever going to regret, and I wish I never did this to you. But there was no true emotion behind it. He always said from the beginning of the relationship is that he lacked empathy. I don't have empathy. You're the one that's empathetic in the relationship. I don't bring that side. I didn't know what a narcissist was, really, at this point. So I always thought, okay, so maybe he's just a little bit less caring or cares a little less than I did. No, like he lacked, he had no empathy for me. He could care less that I'm sitting there broken in front of him, totally devastated because he's been going out and dating other girls behind my back and openly admitted it. Like didn't even try to, you know, deflected or, or 
Well, at that, at that point, the jig was completely up. Oh yeah, there was yeah. there was no going backwards. He already had a, uh, his new supply of whatever he was going to. So the real guy, the actual real real guy, sat there, and you saw this emotionless shark of of a sorts who was yeah. just sitting there, being like, you probably like, so what? What are you gonna do? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't need you anyways. I got somebody on the wing. Like, you know, you're easily replaceable. So, yeah, he didn't care. There was no there was no tear. And I remember just handing him his key back, walking out of the house, and just saying, don't ever contact me again. Of course, he pushed the boundary. Within five minutes of me leaving the house, sends me a text message saying, please tell me, please text me when you get home that you got home safely. <laughs> he, was just check- he was just checking to see if his control would still work. And, and that was just really... Mm-hmm. It's for him, it was all about control to see even in that moment yeah. to see how far maybe he could even take it further because that's his thought process that like yeah. that's how he would have gotten off if she gets home and then she texts me back or this and this happens that would make him feel good that's how sadistic yeah. that is and how it was so now that <laughs> now that it is over yeah. Uh, can you just, I guess, discuss how you're healing, how you're, how you're doing, and maybe discuss how the devaluation took a toll on you? Because you had a lot of, you had a major devaluation happen in the time you were there or, or with yeah. him. So how yeah. did how that take a toll on you, and how are you recovering? Um, I would say the beginning was, was challenging. Um, you know, it was hard. It was like I was having to relive a trauma that had happened to me when I was in my early 20s all over again. Um, it almost felt like a very similar situation. Um, so I was, you know, I was devastated for the first little while. But um, what I started doing, and I don't even know how this came about, but one of my biggest things dealing with healing was to start researching narcissism and everything it was about. I don't even know how narcissists popped into my mind. It's just something I looked up, and I didn't even know to the extent of what I'm, you know, extent of what narcissism was and that it's a mental health issue it's a mental illness and um i always thought that you know people had narcissistic traits i didn't know that there was a full-blown um illness related to it so i just threw myself into studying learning absolutely every single thing i could about narcissism and i probably overdid it and i probably stayed up many nights learning about it and understanding it and I just saw so many similarities to the relationships I was in um, in the past. And I, I could literally full-blown say that I, every relationship that I haven't been, been with a male has been with a narcissist. And, you know, that gave me kind of some tools and some ammo to really look at it and say, like, okay, this is the person I was dealing with. Um, you know, a second form of healing for me was obviously throwing myself into therapy, like, immediately. Like, don't even think about it. Don't. Don't even just just do it. So I found myself uh, one that deals specifically with trauma, and uh, she was fantastic. She, you know, allowed me to vent my situation, but then she was very focused on sorry my situation with the narcissist. But then she was very focused on my healing from my past trauma, on um, the suppression I put, you know, the suppression of just past childhood uh, childhood wounds, you know, the bullying situation with the girlfriends that I had, um, you know, really uncovering where my boundary issues were and where I had, you know, some severe suppression trauma in my life that just, you know, I, I almost pretended like it didn't happen. I wasn't dealing with it. So you, so you have been working on all so all the boundaries that he pushed down or sorry, or he penetrated and that were created from your youth, from when you, you were a child to the stuff that happened with those girls when you were a teenager all of those yeah. types of issues, you then went back to try and, and plug those holes. Yeah, I, I tried to. Obviously, I, I mean, I feel like with, with a narcissistic relationship, you don't you don't just get into them. There's there's a reason why people stay in them, um, and a lot of it has to do with things in your past you may have not dealt with. I this might be hard for some people to maybe hear it, it, for me, it resonated just in my healing and my way of dealing with things was sometimes you meet people like this or you keep going over a situation over and over again to learn from it. And also 
that that narcissist can sometimes be a catalyst for your own personal healing or uncovering past wounds that you haven't dealt with. And as much as I hate that this situation happened and the you know, how you know awful it is to be in, I, in my stage of healing now, can look back on it and say it was the worst, but yet the best thing that's happened to me because it's made me look really, really look inwards and realize why am I going, why am I attracting this? Why am I, why do I keep going back to the same type of person? And what I was able to find is that I had not dealt with a lot of stuff from my past. I had kind of just blocked it up in a box, threw it away into the ocean and said, hey, at some point I'll deal with this, but it ain't going to be now. And it's for, this situation particularly has forced me to deal with it. Well, Jenna Lee, I want to thank you for being on the show today and telling your story and sharing your experience and your knowledge and your healing with us because, you know, your healing process has been yeah. thorough. And one of the things a lot of people sometimes don't realize is it takes a lot of work on your end yeah. to heal and to move forward and doing the work takes, you know, you hear it, but it's, it's a lot of work to do and it's something that you have to do every single day and it's a constant thing. Uh, cause if you let it slide, you'll slip back into your old patterns. And so you have to yeah. kind of do it every single day and build and build and build and build and build until one day you look backwards and there's no way you can go back. You're already that many steps forward and a new foundation has been built. And once that new mm -hmm. foundation has been built, then you can really start rebuilding your house, but it starts off mm -hmm. with rebuilding that new foundation. And it sounds like you've done it and you should be proud of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> for, for doing so. And yeah. I just like, once again, I want to thank you for uh, being on the show. Yeah. And no, thank you for having me and having a podcast that, you know, during my healing journey, just listening to the stories and hearing other women that gave me a place where I can, you know, I feel like I had somebody who understood me or had people who were going through something similar. So I got to say thank you to you as well. Well, you are welcome. And <laughs> on behalf of you, I just want to tell everyone, have a great night, and we'll see you next week. And that was my conversation with Jenna Lee. So once again, I want to thank Jenna Lee for being part of the show. And for everyone out there who always wondered why someone would stay for a certain amount of time uh, or why someone would put themselves through this type of uh, abuse, th this is the reason. They're methodically broken down. And you can see in the story of by someone who is, as someone who is sadistic, uh, her partner at the time, how they actually did it and how they can psychologically uh, get you, tr get the trust in and then keep you on a, on a string. So before I leave you today, just want to say one more time, our Facebook group is hopping and you should go there to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash narcissist apocalypse. You want to be part of our group and also, for a Letters to a Narcissist episode, if you want to be part of that episode, there's a voicemail recorder on our website to record. Go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. It's on the right side of the page. It's a floating button, hard to miss. It says send voicemail. Press that button. Away you'll go. It records once, twice, three times, or four, you know, as many times as you need. It records up to five minutes each time. We're accumulating these letters to have for volume two of that episode, so send us those voicemails. And now... The show is over. Be well and bye for now. <laughs>